All right. Next up, we have My Little AWS IR Sandbox by Michael Wiley. Please welcome Michael. Thank you very much. I'm not getting the slides. Awesome. Okay, a couple familiar faces from uh, 10 minutes ago. That's good, thank you. Um, so, about me again, for those who weren't in here, I'm the uh, Director of Cybersecurity Services at Richie May Technology Solutions. Recently joined their team to help them build up their information security best practices. They do a whole plethora of uh, cloud security, cybersecurity, um, GRC, et cetera. And so I built this talk because uh, we internally built our own little IR sandboxes and, and there's a lot involved with that. And so I'll kind of explain how we did it and what we do here. But a couple statistics, I always like to start my slides with what's the point of the, the talk. And so I think 92.4% of malware being delivered via email is, is one of the key pieces of why we, we started building our sandboxes out. We get a lot of um, cases where there's different malware or phishing attempts that come in and we needed something to, to quickly test these things out. 75% uh, of businesses hit by ransomware were running endpoint protection. So even with your, your EDR solutions, Silence, Carbon Black, uh, MacV, whatever you have in your environment, we still saw the need to be able to test things that got past that. And the average cost for ransomware incidents was 133K in 2017. Obviously, there were some with a lot more. Atlanta ended up spending $2.6 million or more in their incident response situations. Uh, there was uh, the giant shipping companies that, that spent billions of dollars in their ransomware incidents. And then there's the small businesses that probably spend a couple thousand dollars in those cases. But we're seeing a lot of money around these malicious uh, files and things that get past the endpoint protection. And so it's always great to just double check before you go ahead and open a, a Word document or PDF. So in these situations where there's something suspicious going on, we wanted an area that we could quickly and expensively test this out. And so if we look at what's being delivered uh, into mailboxes, we can see that Microsoft Office documents and archives like zip files make up a big portion of that. And then a lot of PDF files as well. And there's a couple different techniques that, that we're seeing that I don't have time to go into detail on right now, but I, I talked some about this on Friday into more about how phishing attempts are, are getting past different uh, email gateways. So when we get some of these files, or if, whether it's phishing or whatever it is that's a little malicious, um, we, we wanted it to be able to solve some of these problems. So we wanted a safe place to detonate malware, uh, avoid spreading the worm to other systems. So if something got infected, we didn't want it to go and spread out. We uh, possibly examine email links and their attachments. So if we saw some type of link and it looked legitimate, but we really wanted to investigate it without detonating it on the endpoint. Uh, to validate documents for phishing attempts, there's a lot of scenarios that uh, le emails look legitimate and they, they bypass security gateways, they bypass the end user, or maybe there was something that was a little fishy and that's why they want us to take a look at it. Maybe you want to learn about your enemy and their tactics. So even if you do see something and it had grammatical errors and there was pixelated graphics and you're pretty obvious, it's pretty obvious that it's not legitimate, you still may want to learn about the, your enemy or who's targeting you. Or maybe it's just a mass distribution of this, this uh, malware or a phishing attempt, you want to look at that and say, well, why did it get past my email gateway? Why did it get past my DNS protection? Why did it get past my uh, inbox or my endpoint protection? All these tools and this layered defense that I have, it still got to the end user and it's in their inbox. So how can we adjust our security to strategy and our controls to better protect against this next time? Because if Sally and HR got this email, we, it's going to come in next time and someone else is going to get it and someone else is going to get it and someone else is going to get it unless we do something. And I think that was a, an old approach of let's go look at the IP address or the email address and we'll block it and be done with it. And so a lot of junior people now have to coach on this and say, that's an old strategy and there's a lot of flaws with that. It might block them from sending another email, but they probably didn't send it to Sally and HR, wait for 24 hours, then they're going to send it to Bob and accounts receivable and so on. It's probably they send to everyone at the same time and they're going to try that technique again and someone else is going to reuse their techniques and it's going to be an ongoing thing. So you can't just block an IP address or an email address. We have to go a little further than that and look at the actual technique tactic and procedure, the TTPs. Um, you might want to prove your security controls, as I said, after you find out why they're bypassing all your other controls. You may build security awareness programs around it. So when we get new malware and we're seeing new techniques each month, we may say, here's a new technique they're using. So one common one we're seeing in the mortgage industry, the mortgage lenders, is that they are um, 
there, people are spoofing escrow officers. And if you've ever bought a house or been involved with that, you can see the escrow officers are very involved in the transaction. And so they're trying to spoof the escrow officer with a DocuSign um, e-signature, and that's the most popular tool out there for these mortgage lenders. So they say, click on this link, or here's the, the secure document, you have to click on this. Ends up being a PDF, and they say, for security reasons, we've encrypted it and put a password on it. And so that also bypasses endpoint protection and email gateways and other stuff because it's a, not only an a encrypted or compressed file, it needs a password. And so then they'll put the password either in plain text or they'll put it in an image that the email gateway can't even see that. So they're bypassing a lot of stuff in those cases. So we may want to build a security awareness program around this or our own phishing campaign around this and maybe using GoFish or FishMe or some other tool and you can test your users to make sure that they're actually doing what you, you recommend. And then you could demonstrate malicious activity. So when you're trying to get executive buy-in and you're trying to sell something you know, to the executives and get them to pay for it, you can show them some of these um, different techniques or how ransomware works uh, in an isolated environment that's not going to impact the rest of your users here. And then, um, so traditional sandboxes. You can go out there, and, and I'm not inventing a new sandbox at all by any means. I'm actually taking a lot of pieces from many other security professionals out there and kind of blending it. So there's hybrid analysis, there's malware, which has been down for I don't know how long, but it's still up there. It was a good one when it was up. Um, Cuckoo, it's a little bit difficult to set up. Uh, you could use VMware or VirtualBox, that's generally a recommendation, but what we're seeing a lot of is that good malware, especially targeted stuff with APTs, they are, bypassing a lot of these malware or they're doing some security checks to see are you running a virtual environment and if you are they're not going to detonate the malware so it looks like it's legitimate then you go run it on an actual bare bones system and it detonates because it's looking at the whether it's the vmware mac address or the NIT cards or vmware tools it's doing a lot of different checks to see if you're trying to reverse engineer the malware um, remnix from sans and there's a bunch of other traditional ones out there but some of the concerns that I had with, with these sandboxes when some of my team pitched the different solutions was they're complex to set up and configure. Cuckoo, I spent hours on and couldn't get it to work properly the way I wanted it to. Uh, some of the analysis tools uh, published by the community, so virus total, um, hybrid analysis. If you upload a document there, it is available for the community. And there's a premium version you can pay for, and I think there's an opt-out there. But other tools that you may use, as well as directly going to some of these sites, you upload a document, it's there for the community to look at and to analyze. And those situations, could you imagine a proprietary document that looks fishy, and so you upload it, and all of a sudden you're leaking that out to the whole world? Also, some of these tools, if you're publishing a binary of the document, now the bad guys and the malware creators know that the signature is in, in virus total and they need to now morph it and adjust it so it can continue to work. So you're basically telling them, I found your stuff, I think it's suspicious, and I'm posting it out there to get analysis on. And now they say, got it, now I'm going to rewrite my techniques here. Um, and then... There, so I needed something that had dynamic um, analysis as well as um, some static analysis because I don't fully trust automated tools. Uh, I think AI and machine learning is an awesome field of study. I just don't think it's doing what a lot of people are advertising it as. And we still need that human eye to say this is legitimate or it's bad and there's a lot of variables that a machine can't quite do yet. <clears throat> and so I also needed advanced malware um, that had, um, or, or I was trying to get around some of the anti-reverse um, engineering techniques. So sometimes these pieces of malware that I'm collecting, they look for internet access. So if I have an isolated virtual machine that's disconnected from the network, it, it goes out and does a DNS check. If it fails, it's going to say, I'm not going to do anything. I'm not letting you look at this. I know I'm not connected to the internet. Other times they'll look, as I mentioned, at VMware Nix, uh, the MAC address, they'll look for the tools that you install. Uh, there's, if there's a number of files that are missing from desktop, so if you just create a virtual machine, vanilla Windows XP or Windows 7 or Windows 10 or whatever you're using, and you have no files on the desktop or documents and no favorites, nothing there, they're checking those, and if it's less than a certain number, a threshold, the, the malware will not detonate. It says, I know I'm in a virtual machine, it's not reasonable for someone to have a machine that has no files on it. If it's an actual user, there's going to be a desktop with a thousand things on it. So they look for that as well. Sometimes they'll also look for tools like Wireshark. It'll look in C programs, Wireshark, and it'll look for the Wireshark.exe file. So I needed a lot of different techniques that I can kind of bypass this or make sure that the pieces of malware weren't going to detect that I was trying to detect them. So my, my RR sandbox requirements in this case, I wanted it to be easy to set up and tear down for the rest of my team so I didn't have to have this complex cuckoo setup. 
I needed it to be low cost so I could spin it up quickly and if I wanted to make changes, it wasn't gonna cost a lot of money and I could get even internal teams from some of our clients to use. I needed it to be isolated, obviously. I didn't wanna go out and detonate malware and have it spread if I didn't know what it did. And it needed to be accessible from anywhere. A lot of times I'm, I'm in San Diego or Los Angeles or Canada and I'm traveling and visiting different clients. And if I get a case that I have to look at some malware, I don't wanna have to say sorry, I have to wait till I get back to my office in Los Angeles in 40 days and then I'll take a look at your malware. By then it's gonna be all over the place. I need those static dynamic tools, the ability to share it with junior members of my team. So some of the newer guys that didn't have quite the skill set that I do, I want it to be easy enough for them to launch it quickly, analyze malware, and they could always send me reports to, to look at a little bit further, but they could detonate the malware or the phishing attempts in this isolated box. And then we'd be able to respond quickly. So I couldn't have two, three, four hours or 40 days before I was able to get my reports. I need to make my decisions very quickly. So here's some of the tools. I'll leave this up for a little bit if anyone wants a, a picture and I can publish the slides later. But here's some of the tools I picked. There's, there's a lot out there, but this is a collection that, that I find really good. And I'm using a Windows box because I'm assuming that my targets are mostly gonna be Windows. And I wanna have these tools on there so I couldn't use certain things that, that are, are Linux or Unix based only. So Wireshark obviously for the full packet capture. And this is one that's going to change in the near future. It's there, but I'm also concerned that it will be caught by some malware and they won't detonate. And I am experimenting currently one of the future versions for this talk. I want to have this in AWS, which it is right now, but I wanna do inline packet capture. And it's a little bit difficult in AWS because I can't go put a wiretap or a packet squirrel between there because it's in Amazon's data center. So I'm experimenting with some different ways of using IP tables to funnel data through a Linux box and then go to my Windows and I can still do full packet capture in line without impacting the device that I'm actually working on. I use Process Explorer because Windows um, you know, Explorer isn't, isn't good enough and looking at the process there, I get a little more detail with Process Explorer. Process Monitor, sometimes I'll pull up, it gives me file system monitoring as well as registry monitoring. But for registries, I really like RegShot and what that will do is it'll take a snapshot of the registry, I launch my malware, I take another shot of the registry and it compares and contrasts the two versions. It'll show me registry keys added, deleted, modified. It's a huge list of file, but at least you have any change that's been done to the registry. I also really like, and this is a recent addition to my, <clears throat> my sandbox, is LogMD. And so LogMD, they call it the malicious file and discovery tool. And really what it does is Windows does not log enough by default. And so what it'll do is it gives you recommendations based off of CIS best practices, um, the Windows logging cheat sheet, the US government uh, baselines, as well as the Australian Cybersecurity Defense Force, their best practices, and then what your computer's set for. So my first launch of that, it'll give me just what I should be logging compared to what I am logging, because Windows won't even tell me if I failed to log in correctly, right, by default. So I have to turn all these logs on, the advanced logging, retention, PowerShell logging, all those things have turned on, so that's my checklist. Um, once I get that set up, then it'll also query different information for me. So it'll give me a lot more data on login attempts or PowerShell scripts run, and it's a great logging tool. I need a disassembler so I can look at some binaries and find out what they're doing. Um, TRID is a file identifier. I normally just use file inside of uh, Linux, the command, but since we're running Windows, I need something that's gonna try and identify the type of file. UPX, it's a, a common packer for malware, and so it'll help me unpack it if it's, if it's packed with UPX. Um, I can use different memory dump tools. I'm experimenting with this at the moment over the next couple of months to figure out better options for this. Uh, strings, one of my favorite tools on there. You can get strings for Windows as part of Sys internals. It'll scan a file and tell you any strings that are inside this. And I've, I've found at least four um, zero day vulnerabilities in tax software just using strings. It's one of my favorite tools out there. Uh, PE Viewer, it, it looks at executable files and analyzes them for you. There's quite a few of those. Resource Hacker, it'll try and look for DLLs or other libraries that the malware or the file in question might be calling. We've got um, uh, PDF ID, so in certain cases where you have a PDF file, it's gonna parse through that because the tool strings doesn't do a great job. There's a lot of things that are compressed and inflated and, and et cetera. And so that's a better tool than strings if it's a PDF file. Uh, file Analyzer, it'll look at the executable information. P Studio is another executable tool. Dependency Walker, that's a great one that's gonna look for DLL calls. And if, if it's a piece of tool that says it's um, like a game, but yet it's all of a sudden requesting registry changes and other libraries that are unusual, that's gonna give you an idea and say, this DLL shouldn't be being called by a game, it makes no sense. 
Um, a couple other PE tools at the bottom there. Some additional tools that a lot of people that write these blogs for malware analysis don't call out, but I'd say I install Chrome and Firefox. A lot of times I don't want to have just IE. This is one check that a lot of malware will do and say, do, do they have other browsers installed? Uh, they're, they're making an assumption that most people aren't just going to have Internet Explorer, and so if you just have Internet Explorer, they might say this isn't a real computer. Uh, Silence Protect and Optics, uh, Carbon Black has one out there, but the thing I like about Silence Protect and Optics is that they're CyberForce, uh, they're a company in Irvine, I think, and they will sell you five, one or five user licenses. So I put this in my sandbox if I don't have 100 endpoints. I just want one license, I throw it up in Amazon on my, my EC2 instance, and I could do my analysis without buying 100 endpoints from Carbon Black. And I put it in learning mode, so it's not blocking anything, it's just analyzing stuff, and it gives me a little more input of something maybe I missed. Um, Adobe Reader, another check that malware will do to see if you are if you are a legitimate box. Microsoft Office, this is the one I forgot in version one of my sandbox, and then I opened up a someone had a P, uh, email and I tried to open the Office document. And I thought, oh, that makes sense. I need Word, right? So you have to have Office Suite on there. Uh, multiple files and folders in the user's profiles. I mentioned documents, uh, all kinds of stuff. You could put fake files in there. They just have to have content in your profile. And then you can rename your analysis tool. So don't leave it default. You can change the executable name so it doesn't look like that. Um, if you've ever seen talks um, where they say change Mimi cats to Mimi dogs, it's the same type of concept. You're just modifying the, the hash and or the name of the file so it doesn't get picked up by some of these pieces of malware. A bunch of online tools for shortcuts. I, I don't just have all the devices on or the, all the tools on my system. I will use get file hash to grab the, uh, the hash of this, the file in question. I then put it to virus total. In this case, I'm not giving them the binary or the actual file. Instead, I'm giving them the hash, the fingerprint of the file, and seeing if it's been found before. And in this case, I'm not sharing more information with the malware creator or the community than I need to. I'm all for sharing with the community, but I don't want more information to get out there that doesn't need to, especially in my analysis phase. Um, a bunch of other tools out there. You could do who is history. You can look for blacklists. Um, the other one at the bottom, which I, I really enjoy, is CloudShark. Oops. CloudShark and PacketTotal, you could take your PCAPs, upload it, and it'll do a quick analysis for you to look for malicious traffic or URLs. And as I mentioned, logging. <clears throat> you absolutely have to have logging on there. There's not enough logging done by default inside of Windows, so you've got to turn that on. Log MD, as I mentioned, or the Windows um, log checklist, those are great places to go. And you can take a look at that. Even the CIS benchmarks, you could start there. It's just not enough. I would absolutely say well, Log MD will give you a lot more information to log. So you log, uh, use window or log MD, you run it the first time with a dash one and it'll go ahead and give you your, whether you're in compliance and which different standards you're in compliance with or out of compliance with. And so I love this, uh, this part, it'll tell me my computer, if I'm doing successful or failed loggings or if I'm not logging at all, and it'll compare me to the different baselines of CIS, the US uh, government, is it a compliance baseline or something like that, the Australian, uh, cyber defense security or whatever they are, it'll give me all of those and then the Windows logging cheat sheet, it'll just show me all of them, the different logs of what I'm doing it or not, but you want all these loggings turned on if you're looking at malware or suspicious activity. So what I do is I've created, and you can absolutely take this home or to your office and you can start doing this, set up an AWS account, you set up an isolated VPC, you don't want to be doing this in your production network. Um, you then create an EC2 instance with at least four gigs of RAM. You're paying by the hour, so you could even do more than that, but I found four gigs is pretty adequate, and it's legitimate. A lot of you systems still have four gigs or eight gigs of RAM, so it's enough to pass the malware checks. Um, install tools and logging, fake files, create shortcuts, make it look like a legitimate user profile. Um, I set the background to red because when I'm doing remote desktop into the system, and I'm, I'm, it might be a production system or a client system, I want an absolute indication I'm on the right box. And if it's got the default blue background, I might be installing malware on a production server not paying attention. So I put that red background, make it very clear of the system that, that I'm on. And then I create an image for it so I can use it again in AMI. Deploy the instance, and one thing you do when you use Wireshark or whatever analysis tools, you have to exclude uh, port 3389, otherwise Wireshark just tons of stuff from your own login session to it. So this is essentially what it comes down to, what my box looks like with all my tools. Um, I started adding a whole lot more uh, documents on the desktop and the profile since then, but I have other tax software, maybe QuickBooks, whatever you can think of to make it look more legitimate and a bunch of stuff on there that it's not just a vanilla box.
So it's the future things that I'm going to work on for the next iteration and future talks, and you could check out the, the Richie May Tech uh, blog, and I'll have definitely something on this within the next probably 30 days or so, maybe 60. And I want to add additional tools to it. I really want inline packet capture so I don't have that running on my system. I don't want the malware or the phishing to look and see that the device is on promiscuous mode. Uh, so I want to remove Wireshark, and then I also want to have these PCAPs fed into Sericata or Bro with an Elk stack. So I'm doing off-system logging because the malware could be corrupting my logs, deleting my logs, messing with those. So I want to get those logs off and running it through some type of tool that's looking for signatures. That's maybe taking stuff from MITRE or, or TTPs or whatever they are, and that way I have a second thing that's looking at my, my logs, my PCAPs, to see if there's any malicious activity. So that's all I have for this. Um, are we on questions or outside? Couple questions? Probably got three minutes for questions if anyone has any. In the back? I have it, so it would be on a system that's in line so that the traffic's going through there and then passing through, or how, do, how is it going to work in AWS? Yeah. We need something similar like that. Okay. Absolutely. I'd love to get it off the, the EC2 instance. I just feel like it's way too obvious that Wireshark's on there and that it's doing the, it's putting the NIC in promiscuous mode, and I just I feel like that's a red flag to anyone writing malware. Absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, well, I'll be around in the hall if you have any questions. Enjoy uh, TorCon. Thank you for your time.